everybody, I'm Scott, and welcome to Shelfware. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the rule of St. Benedict by St. Benedict himself, and I'll be talking with Jason Harrigan, a good friend, um, yeah, who's who's uh, very much into this kind of stuff, uh, but I'm really excited to, to talk to him. Hello, Jason. Hello, Scott, and thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you for being here. I'm thank you. Too. Yeah. <laughs> So what is your connection with the, the rule of St. Benedict? I suppose a bit of, a bit of context on what the rule is first, just sure. very quickly. Yeah. I mean, the rule, the rule of St. Benedict, St. Benedict, for people who wouldn't know, uh, was a 6th century Italian who, who had moved to Rome to further his education from a place called Nursia and found himself uh, kind of put out by the pagan extravagance of Rome, of 6th century Rome. And uh, he took to the countryside, uh, he moved to Subiaco and pursued a life of uh, essentially as a hermit. And while he was there, people gathered around him because they could see he was living a certain kind of life that was appealing. There's always a counterculture when there's excess. When there's excess in society, there's always a group of people who move away from that excess and that sets themselves kind of apart. And ultimately, anyway, through, through over a period of years, he established a monastic foundations, as we'd understand them, monastic orders, who, who go on to this day as the Benedictines and some other associated orders. And the rule of St. Benedict is a very, very small handbook that he wrote in the 6th century as a guide. Uh, even, even the word rule is a little bit misleading because the, there's nothing really dictatorial about this book. It's suggestions. It's... Mm practicalities um, that were there for these for these monastic communities to live together. And that's been going within the monastic world, you know, 16, 14, 1600 years almost now, 1500 years later, it's still applicable and still being used. My first experience with it was uh, just over a decade ago, I was I was actually speaking to someone uh, in the UK at, a, at an event I was at. And we were talking just about that, about life and family. I'm married and I have kids. And we're talking about, you know, the ways of the world. I think this was about the time things were starting to go wrong with the global economy. And mm. people were questioning the very kind of setup of how we live as a society. If you remember the great kind of crashes, uh, 2008, 2010, that period. Mm. And... I was saying, well, I, I'm lucky in a way. Uh, looking back, it wasn't luck, but like I, I, I've kept things kind of modest. I haven't overextended myself. Very boring, practical, financial stuff. And he said, "Oh God, it sounds like you, 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 you followed the rule of Benedict." And I went, "What's the rule of Benedict?" <laughs> and I came back to Warren, and he sent me a copy. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And I read it and clicked. It clicked just like, you know, if you ever read a book or a text or something and it just clicks with you, you just get it the first time. Mm. And I read it again. And on first reading, it can seem very mundane. It's about looking after members of the community, how to run a monastery, the role, the different roles different people play and stuff like that in a monastery. Mm -hmm. The abbot, cellarer, <laughs> you know, uh, the servers. And, and that can seem very ordinary and mundane, but that was kind of the point that struck me first, was that this was a guide for people who were ostensibly leading these, leading these extraordinary lives compared to what I knew at that time. And I, I had some interaction with monastic communities at that time, but just as a member of the general public, they seemed somewhat exotic and different. And yet their rule book was very much a book of common sense, and practicality and the, the, there's a line in it that there's nothing in here that it's a little rule for beginners you know that there's nothing in in the rule that should put people off and that's what I found when I read it and I, I started my kind of it just became increasingly more and more important in my life and became a framework that I found very comfortable to use as a framework for living and and moved on deeper and deeper from there but that was my first experience was someone sent it to me uh, and as often the way these things happen 
Oh, no question. No question. <laughs> yeah. And you, you passed it to me. Um, yeah. And I read it yeah. and, uh, yeah, I found it, uh, really something, you know, um, it, it's incredible to think, you know, that's, uh, what, 1400 years ago. Um, yeah. and, and you're reading this and, uh, yeah, it, it just, it's, uh, it's got this simplicity to it that, um, it's something that I'm embracing pretty hard at the moment. Um, trying to uh, simplify. <laughs> and then this is a framework in which to do that, it feels to me. That's it. And it, it, it's very simplicity, if you like, is that is that discretion that was used by Benedict when he was putting it together. And, in, and to me, it's 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 its genius. Uh, you know, a lot of the books I've read in recent years that have to do with, say, uh, simplifying your life or just coping with the world around you, strategies for survival. It's a whole <laughs> publishing industry, as you yes, know. Yes, for sure. But, but they can't just say, they can't just state the simple thing. They have to come up with more convoluted terms and, you know, you're learning off all kinds of new buzzwords that they're just being mm -hmm. created. Whereas this, this rule, is, which, as you say, has been around for 1,400 years, very simply states the case for leading a life of, of intention uh, right from the very outset. So people who aren't familiar with the rule, it's a very short work. There's 73 very small chapters or rules, if you like, within it. And the book itself runs to like 90 pages in a booklet form, not even in a full book form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the very first word of the rule is listen. And that uh, we could talk for the next hour just about that book. <laughs> and the importance of listening and what it means. And what always struck me was I was great at hearing for a lot of my life. I mm. heard everything going on. I heard rumors. Mm -hmm. I heard half stories about people. I heard half the facts. But listening is a very much a different skill. And to listen is to really listen with intention. Um, and and kind of starts even in the rule of Benedict with listening to yourself. And that's something I think a lot of people have forgotten to do. They don't even, you know, I, I would have found it difficult at times to find the space to listen to myself, listen to what my own thoughts are saying, listen to what my mind is saying, listen to what my body was saying. Is that pain in my back? I go, oh, but that's just because I'm I'm getting mm -hmm. older, but maybe that's stress. Maybe that's mm -hmm. tension, you know, to really listen and then to act on what you have listened to. And that's the, even that very first word, as I say, from the rule jumped out at me like a kind of five bell alarm mm -hmm. where I said, I've been hearing all kinds of things, but I've been listening to nothing. Yeah. And maybe I should yeah. start listening to, to those around me, uh, I found it great, for example, a really practical thing as a dad with three kids to listen to my children as opposed to just hear them as background noise. Yeah. Or right. to think that I know better than them because I'm the grown up. Um, so I only need to hear them and then respond to how I feel is the best way rather than actually listen to them and then actively act whether I want to or not on what I've learned from listening to them. And mm -hmm. listening can be difficult like that. It can it can kind of challenge us to to act in ways we're maybe a bit uncomfortable with because we've actively listened and understood at a, at a deeper level what it is we're hearing. Um, so right yeah. from the back, I was like, "This is great stuff." You know? Yeah, wow, that's that's awesome. That's wonderful. The uh, you know, and that ties into uh, something I know I've discussed with you in the past is um, you know getting in these modes where. Uh, even in yourself, um, you can't even seem to finish a sentence, you know, in your, in your thoughts, because you're being peppered. Um, you're allowing all, all that to come in too. And it's tied into the listening thing because, yeah. um, you, you are being inundated with input. You're allowing yourself to be inundated with input and you don't finish your thoughts. You, you just simply can't. So, um, that that's actually an example of not listening. You are yeah. you are just overwhelming your inputs, um, and I've been in that mode a few times. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's it's it 
it becomes more and more relevant every day in the world we live in. And, and even in like a lot of the world here in Ireland, we're in lockdown scenarios. And you would think that this would be an opportunity to kind of pause and reset. But what I found myself do was listening more and more to news streams and checking the news cycle for latest numbers and latest figures of what, what exactly was going on. And not just here locally to me in Ireland, but following what was happening in France or the United States, stuff I, I have no control over here, let alone any place else. And uh, with, with the way the world is set up now, um, it's just, if you allow it, if you're passive about it, you can have notifications going on your phone, on your iPad, on your smartwatch, uh, 24 hours a day. And other people you're sitting with, even when you're sitting with other people trying to have a real life conversation, their phones are going <laughs> and their notifications are going off and they're interrupting the flow of, of conversation to say, this just happened or that just happened or, or whatever just happened. And I think finding a, finding places in our life where we can just be in the now, where nothing else matters except what's going on, a bit like this conversation, mm -hmm. where nothing else matters except this conversation we're having. It It's really important for, for me to try and do as an individual. And other people I know, I think they really see the benefit of... Um, of doing it too and a kind of an interesting just you know i'm a, a bookish kind of guy <laughs> and I like my study and research yes. and stuff mm -hmm. the, the latin word to obey or to do things is over there and the latin root word to kind of listen is odere they share the same root mm. and that's what i'm saying we need to we need to listen and then have the obedience or the will if you like to act on what we understand. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, I think increasingly we're only getting parts of stories and snippets and our own, our own ego is mm -hmm. stitching those together. Our own personality with all its flaws as a human personality is creating narratives that seem real to us, but have no place in reality. That's a dangerous kind of world to live in, yeah, where yeah. where your own truth, what what you what you decide becomes your own truth, from hearing lots of things but not really listening to stuff, becomes a very real world that you live in, right. when actually yeah. it's not rooted in any reality at all. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things, um, in my life lately, I'd say, I don't know, within the last 10 years or something, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of non-Catholics, I'm Catholic, you're Catholic. Um, mm -hmm. but one of the, one of the things that I've noticed that people react to in a really positive way is the whole idea of Lent, you know, the idea of, um, taking something that you feel is in the way, something that has taken or has imbalanced your life. And uh, tossing that aside for 40 days, um, which is, um, you know, uh, I, I guess the whole monastic movement kind of comes from things like uh, examples from Jesus, you know, going into the desert, you know, and um, being by himself uh, for prayer um, for, you know, an extended period of time, you know, 40 days. Um, but... Um, that that idea I found is very appealing to uh, non-Catholic people, and in the same way, when I'm reading this uh, rule of Saint Benedict, you know, we we've talked about simplicity and we've talked about listen, um, but this idea of uh, attachment um, and detaching yourself and um, is is another aspect of the rule that I feel is uh, important, and and it ties into this thing with Lent. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the rule has these kind of funny little chapters about looking after the utensils of the monastery, you know, <laughs> yeah. taking care of the bowls that you use to eat out of washing them. It, it, it kind of says to treat them almost as sacred vessels. Yeah. And it, there's a twofold reason for that in a very practical way. And one is to say that we should be mindful of what we have. We should be modest in our means that, you know, we only need enough to be comfortable and and the rule again is very clear about that and it says to 
to give each kind of brother or sister in the monastery or convent that what they need according to their needs. So it's not like everyone has to be walking around in rags. And, <laughs> you know, that's not the yeah. point of it. Mm-hmm. But all of but. But by treating things with kind of some kind of respect, like like uh, as you know, I I was a tradesman, and like it was kind of drummed into us to look after our tools, because <laughs> your tools have to be performing well to get the job done properly. Um, but that's there's a there's still a detachment because it's just a tool in of itself. There's a material detachment from it. And Lent has that kind of process where you can take something. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. It could be something, the classic in Ireland when I was younger was giving up sugar in your tea, you know, <laughs> where you took a physical object out of your life for 40 days. And, mm-hmm. and that's how a lot of people ended up never go back because it would taste so sweet after 40 days. <laughs> right. not having tea. Mm-hmm. But uh, material detachment is really important. It's very under, It's very important to understand that there's nothing bad or inherently evil or anything like that in having things. The mm-hmm. danger comes in the attachment we have to them. Um, yeah, and I think right. one of the things in the rule that's great is this idea of kind of ownership and material attachments that, you know, w- w- I lead a comfortable life. I want all the things to make my life as comfortable as possible. Uh, I'm not living in a cave on the side of a mountain. Mm-hmm. I'm living in a suburban, <laughs> suburban house with all the uh, with all the comforts for me and for my family, you know. Sure, yeah. But at the same time, I'm very conscious of the amount of stuff I consume and the amount of things I have, and that even comes down to stuff like tying them in Lent with eating and drinking, and you know, mm-hmm. a lot of the I'd be lucky enough with my health, but I'm sure. I could do a lot of damage to my health just by losing control of myself when it comes to eating and drinking, for example, particularly as I get older. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. You know, so these Mm -hmm. are just, again, very, very practical reasons to practice detachment and to practice a little bit of what would be called an ascetic kind of practice in monastic terms, where you would forego something, not to punish yourself or to feel bad about it, but you would forgo something to kind of make a point to yourself that you don't need all these little extra things to make yourself complete and happy as a person. Yeah. You need as a person. Really, I mean, the rule of Benedict is about love. It's about finding love. Uh, in, mm-hmm. in the Catholic context or the, the Christian context he's talking, it's about finding, finding love through seeking God but also finding love in a very practical way, living in a community of people. Mm-hmm. And that, that interaction is what's important. And that's why he makes great things about don't be grumbling and mumbling if you're mm-hmm. a monk. Don't be walking around whispering about people or casting, yeah. casting crude jokes at, at their expense. Mm-hmm. You know, think carefully about what you speak. And like one of the greatest things I ever done for Lent one time was actually to actually pause for a second before I open my gob <laughs> and you and forth my opinion on everything. Because I'll have an right. opinion on everything in the world if you, <laughs> if you give me the, the soapbox. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think Benedict was, was clever in realizing that the, the mouth and what comes out of it is the cause of a lot of damage. And unfortunately, we're, we're often unaware of that damage that is caused until after the fact, mm. until after we have done it. Right. Uh, I always like the World War II analogy, you know, loose lips sink ships, <laughs> you see on the posters. Yep, yep. Just to remind people, be conscious of the company you're in, be conscious of how you speak. Mm. Uh, the rule says that about monks living together in a monastery, kind of secluded right. away. But really, that's just society. It's just a microcosm of wider yeah, society. Yeah, no question. And and you read that, and he he talks also about uh, specifically the abbot and how the abbot ought to act. Um, yeah. You know, so here's a leadership model right here presented. Um, you know, yep, you you're leading some people. Hey, this is kind of how you should do that. That's it. Either as a father or as a mother or as a community leader or a boss in work 
or the team. Um, and, and like the kind of strictest rules that Benedict lays down are for the abbot. Mm -hmm. And he goes to great pains to say what type of person you should elect as an abbot, <laughs> you know, that the because the community elects their, their abbot. Mm -hmm. And the kind of the awesome responsibility that falls with that position. Um, and again, just to bring it back to that practical everyday stuff like that, as a parent, be it as a father or as a mother, uh, as a team leader, say, in work or within mm -hmm. your community, you could be involved in all types of groups or organizations. Um, you have to kind of remove yourself a little bit from the position first and understand what the position is, and then you can insert yourself. Mm -hmm. But the danger is you impose yourself first on the position without really understanding what's called for. And right, I have found, right. for example, as a parent, where I have started out with no guidebook, because there is none. I wish there was a parenting. Yeah, but you yeah. got the parenting <laughs> With well, charts and graphs. With charts. Uh, <laughs> yeah, with one of those uh, troubleshooting sections, right. you know. <laughs> FAQs prepared. Absolutely, but, yeah. But because I, because I had my own idea of what it was to be a dad, for example, or a husband, um, I expected things to be a certain way. But, of course, the world went, no, you don't, Jason. It's not mm -hmm. going to be that way at all. And uh, that's quite a humbling thing to realize is that, you know, even in, even in positions of responsibility, I think humility, which comes through the rule in spades, and again, being my bookish wonk, you know, humility, the word humble comes from hummus, mm. which is earth or soil. We say someone is the salt of the earth yeah. or, you know, is kind of down to earth guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And really what we're talking about there is the ability to be humble and to practice humility. Which unfortunately, in recent decades, has somehow been twisted into kind of a weakness. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there. It yeah. is a strength. It's mm -hmm. a huge strength. You know? Yeah, and then um, because it, 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 it as a leader, you know, uh, as it shows in the in the rule, um, the the worth of the others is emphasized. You know, so yeah, the the abbot could be the dictator, but instead it says, uh, when you're making this decision, you need to take into account these people, you know? Um, and it says that right in the rule. So basically you're saying the other people that are around you have worth and you need to take their input. And, uh, that's humility, right? That's, it. And, that's and, humility as and, a leader. Mm -hmm. And to listen, even in the rule, it says to listen to the very newest to yeah. the very youngest monks, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it, it comes back to that opening word about listening. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, yeah. it, all of these, all of these roles I find that I have to perform in, in life, you know, as a husband, as a father, as, as a friend to people or whatever else, they all require me to listen. Mm. Uh, and I'm better at them when I do. Mm -hmm. And, we will find good advice where we least expect it. You know, they always say the kind of the gold is buried deep uh, when you're in, when you have like a friendship with someone or a relationship with someone. Often it's the offhand remark or there's something that slipped into a conversation that if you're listening, you'll pick up on it mm -hmm. and it will strike a chord. And uh, th that's, I found that hugely beneficial. You can come away from a conversation with someone and, and for a day or two, that can be mulling around in your head. Just the little phrase uh, that was brought up. We, we, we talked briefly yesterday about spirituality in relation to another book you were talking to mm. about. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't remember the exact phrase of it, but like it's been rolling my around in my head all night, the way the author in that book used the phrase, and you were even saying it seemed the best thing. Mm -hmm. And it's things like that will bring up the questions, and then our job is to try to find some kind of answer. And we find answers everywhere. Um, but generally, we find answers with only really full answers with external help. Mm -hmm. We're not going to find them all internally. 
So we have right. to listen. <laughs> and to, that's, to that's, all, that's the idea of community, right? Yeah, we have yeah. to listen to all those voices, mm -hmm. the oldest and the youngest. Yeah, but the, the role of the abbot, and I know personally know abbots. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know I go to, to one monastery of Benedictine monks in particular, but I've been to many. And humility would be one of the key words I would use to describe any abbot I've ever mm. met. Um, and they will greet you at the door mm. as an equal. Yeah. They will seat you as an equal, you know, mm. or even as better to them, you know. Uh, the position doesn't hold any fancy, uh, fancified kind of titles beyond abbot, which is just, the, you know, the kind of father or abbotess, the mother of the community. Right. Um, right. But really, it, it, it's a, it, I think a lot of them are daunted by it when it's handed to them because they understand maybe more than I did when I became a parent, they understand the awesome responsibility <laughs> that that kind of position uh, brings in the community. Yeah. yeah. And, and we could learn a lot. Communities could learn a lot by Absolutely. listening to it. And listening yeah. to every voice. Yeah. yeah. And, and what that, that doesn't mean, Scott, then, that you have to kind of take everything as truth that you hear. You still need to be able to discern what's then useful. And this is the other side of, you know, maybe the experience of being an abbot and someone who is experienced in life and has shown a track record of action, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of deeds and words and actions that reflect that they understand this kind of process. Um, but everything should be given equal consideration or weight of consideration. Yeah. And then you can move forward with a, with a solution, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, one of the one of the things that um, seems to be a, a movement in in and outside of religious communities um, uh, right now is the, this whole idea of silence, which seems to be the opposite of listening, right? Um, but I, I feel that they're related. I mean, when you believe that there's a God, um, silence is in a way uh, listening. So, um, but there, there's this whole uh, you know uh, we have. Um, Cardinals, Cardinal Sarah wrote a book called The Power of Silence. I know that yeah. there's some secular books on silence. Um, so what, what do you what do you make of those things? What what is the benefit of quiet? Well, you, you you've come into my bailiwick now, Scott. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of silence, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, even f within within the religious kind of theme of it. I think you need to have that silence if you're going to if you're going to hear or understand anything. Um, but in a broader kind of sense, the silence it's a very active process again. You know, even the, a lot of people you see a lot of books now on mindfulness and meditation and you know, mm. five minute meditation before the day. It is a very, very difficult process to learn and it's just a process to learn to clear your mind and to clear those thoughts that bubble up and you'll read all kinds of tips you know let the thought bubble up and float away to the surface of your consciousness and stuff like that and mm -hmm. you know it depends on the book you're reading and and the approach of the author but but really it's just practice uh practice at silence and being in silence um and some people are very uncomfortable with silence some people can't, they, 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 they're unwilling to confront what will bubble up in, in periods of silence, particularly yeah. in extended periods of silence. That's one thing that you've, you've said to me before is this idea that uh, you can go on a lengthy retreat, um, a lengthy silent retreat, no less. Um, and the idea that that's going to be peaceful is not certain, <laughs> right? No, it, like, mm -hmm. a lot of, like a lot of things... You know, even the concept of silence now and mindfulness, the, 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 it's kind of idealized or romanticized as mm. if it's some kind of a nirvana or, you know, the silence is where it, it, it's really a battleground. You know, you can go Freudian and say it's going to be a battleground between your id and your ego. Mm -hmm. You could look at it from a, from a Christian point of view and say it's going to be the battleground between your soul and and sin and evil, 
mm-hmm. trying to do that. You know, we have the example of Jesus going into the desert for 40 days. And that wasn't sitting in a rock navel gazing. That was battling. Mm-hmm. That was warfare in, in a very real sense, in a very spiritual, real sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And people who people who, who first encounter silence in that kind of setting where, like I would go on retreats, where you could go for two, three days. You really need to go for a day at least, but two, three days is a long time where you don't speak, nor does anyone speak to you. You, you don't really engage physically mm-hmm. or vocally with anyone. And you... You deliberately don't have radios and TVs in your phone. You might have some reading material. And that's about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have been at those, and I quite enjoy it because I'm used to. But that they, they are, they can be very difficult. But on more than one occasion, I've seen someone pack their bags after five or six hours, who's in the same facility or the same monastery, and go, mm-hmm. "This isn't for." Wow. Mm-hmm. This isn't for me. Uh, and what do you think is going on with that person? What What do you think is the difficulty? You know, I think I think unfortunately for a lot of people now, when do they ever get the chance to be in silence? Yeah, you know, yeah. In, in in it's particularly in the developed Western world, you know. And I'm not talking here now about loneliness or isolation. There's certainly huge amounts of people who lead, lead very, sadly, very lonely lives where mm-hmm. they don't have huge amounts of physical interaction with other people. Like they can be in, you know, almost seem like a hermit living in their apartment or their house or whatever, even surrounded by hundreds of thousands of people in the big metropolitan area. Mm-hmm. Sure. But, but they don't have that silence. There's so many distractions now. They'll have the television or the phone or the internet or, mm-hmm. you know, all kinds of things that can get, can block out or comes with silence. But to take yourself away to someplace where silence is, is fundamental to the experience of being there mm-hmm. and where there really isn't any other option other than to do it, that can, in a very short period of time, start to bring up feelings of unease in people. And... Coming back to that listening, and I said it at the outset, really, one of the things that, about listening is to learn how to listen to yourself, to listen to your thoughts and listen to what your body is telling you and what your feelings or emotions are telling you. Mm. And really, the only chance you will ever listen, get to really, truly listen to yourself is in some kind of silence. Mm. And I warn anyone you know, who hasn't done it before, mm-hmm. you may not like very much what you see the first couple of times you do it. But that's good because from there, you can do that active listening. Like I was saying, you can make those changes. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I'm a very flawed individual. I'm a very flawed person. I'm a human being. Uh, there's whole aspects of my character I wish were better. There's things I wish I coped with better. There's things I've done, said that I wouldn't be very proud of. And they're the kind of things when you put yourself away from everything because you you carry those around because at some level there's an awareness that this isn't right. Hmm. Whether coming at it from a religious point of view or a secular point of view, just a basic humanity point of view, I think fundamentally there is an awareness that everything isn't well. And what we do really well at pa- papering over. I mentioned this to you in a conversation recently. We do really well at papering over cracks mm-hmm. in society, in churches, in community groups, at work, in families. But where we're the best at it, Scott, is mm-hmm. papering the cracks over ourselves. <laughs> and I think, Indeed, yeah. I think that silence allows you to peel back all those bits of plaster you've stuck on Mm -hmm. over a lifetime experience and have a look at those wounds in the raw and say, I really need to fix this because as long as I keep it covered up with a plaster, it isn't getting better. And it's still, it's still there. That might sound a bit extreme, but I do think that even people, even if people don't necessarily recognize that's what's happening, that's often the process that comes from, spending time in silence and time with your own thoughts. And the flip side of that, to go on a little bit more so it's not all doom and gloom, Mm -hmm. is it can be the most wondrous thing. It can lead to the most wondrous moments of my life have generally happened in silence. Mm -hmm. It's when I've heard and understood 
the most mm. I'll say of my faith as a person of faith of my religion as a Catholic mm-hmm. it's when, when I've felt closest to something beyond myself that's just right. awesome and awe-inspiring awe in that traditional you know we say awesome all the time mm-hmm. but tru- truly, truly awesome. awesome yeah truly mm-hmm. and I find it easier and there's, there's this story in the Bible about you know coming out from the cave through the kind of the storm and the the howling, mm-hmm. you know, and, and God's voice is just a whisper. Mm-hmm. The danger is in life that um, let alone God's voice, if you're if you're religious or people of faith, the danger is you'll walk by and miss it. You know? Mm-hmm. But also just in everyday life, just secular life, because I know a lot of people listening won't be necessarily, you know, sure. Catholic or whatever. Mm-hmm. Is that uh, we'll miss that coming from a loved one. We'll miss that quiet voice that's actually asking us something, asking us to do something or telling us something that needs addressing. We'll miss that coming from someone we care about. It could be a spouse or a family, mm-hmm. a child. That unless we teach ourselves to listen and drown out all that background noise, we're going to miss those really important moments where yeah. we get to truly connect with someone else and make a difference mm-hmm. to ourselves and to, to them. And mm-hmm. For me, silence is silence is the field I go to plough to reap those kind of moments. Mm. That I harvest that kind of stuff. Yeah, Does yeah. that makes absolutely. Sense? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I've felt that too. Even in the um, you know the short times I've I've been able to to practice that, but um, I've never been on a lengthy retreat. You know that lasts for days. Um, but, uh, you should try a month sometime. <laughs> yeah, I need to try it. Um, but yeah, I definitely need to, uh, to do that more, but yeah, when you create that space in, in your own life, um, trying to, to figure it out, you know, not everybody has access to a monastery or, or, no. um, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and speaking of that, you're, you're something, um, called an oblate, right? And, yeah. uh, could you explain what that means? A Benedictine oblate. Yeah, the Benedictine part is just is just the order in particular, mm-hmm. Saint Benedict, founded by Saint Benedict, the Benedictine monks, and uh, so they all monasteries are their own kind of community. So you have Benedictine, and other groups follow the rule, like the Cistercians, who are kind of Benedictine, and the Trappists, and various mm-hmm. other orders. Um, and an oblate really is just someone who. He associates themselves with a particular monastery. Um, and the thing about being an oblate, let me say from the outset, is you don't even have to be that necessarily the, the same faith as that monastery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but in my case, I am. In most mm-hmm. cases, they are. But just to point that out, it's worth noting. Some places don't, don't have that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and really what you're doing is an oblation is like a vow or a promise, a promise more than a vow where you would kind of make an oblation, an obligation, if you like, once a year to external from the monastery, try and and try being the operative word, try and uh, live your life according to that kind of Benedictine tradition, to the rule of St. Benedict, or in your personal kind of prayer life, which for me would involve using the breviary, the daily office, mm-hmm. Alexio Divina, retreats, all those kind of great things. The, the unofficial slogan is kind of Ora et Labora, mm-hmm. which is prayer and work. Hmm. And it's finding that balance in your life. And I find it great for that kind of stuff. Yeah, There's great bands. Um, but also how you live your life. You try to be an example for other people in the community, other people in your family. Um, evangelical in a sense, but I'm much more of the contemplative gently gently style than mm-hmm. the pushy in your face uh style a lot of people who know me a long time would never know i was uh, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, right. uh, but really by your by your how you live your life and your deeds and your actions and making that space in your life even though you're not a monk or a nun or a priest and nor are you trying to be some version of that because you are living outside but an oblate is someone who has an affinity, I think, for something like the rule of St. Benedict and for the, the ideals and the charisma of monastic life mm-hmm. and applies it to the best of their individual ability 
outside of that setting um, and tries to, uh, as my mother used to always tell me, you got to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Mm -hmm. So as well as being able to talk about it and read about it and understand it and philosophize about it, <clears throat> get out there and do stuff. Yeah. Do stuff helpful to people in your community. You know, that's a, that, that's a wonderful thing that, that spurs a thought in my head um, that, uh, you know, I'll share here because, you know, I, I, I grew up Catholic and then I fell away. And then yeah. while I was, you know, because at 13, I knew everything and I knew that that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, oh, but anyway, sure. in my in my 20s, of course, I'm, uh, it never left me. Um, it, you know, even though I grew up that, that way, it, it was always there. And I started to look at all these other religions where I'm, uh, you know, here's Hinduism. Isn't that interesting? Here's Buddhism. Isn't that interesting? Here's other sects of Christianity. Aren't those interesting? And um, it wasn't until I made that decision to return to the Catholic Church and then start to practice that I was able to achieve in any kind of depth. Um, so it was basically you know, I could spend all my time just bouncing around the edges of everything, or I could participate. And yeah. uh, the idea of this participation was what allowed uh, depth to occur, I think. Um, so it, it may be the same kind of a thing here. It's like, yeah, isn't this interesting? But like you said, if you take a step to practice, now you are really discovering what is there. You're not just uh, theoretically or philosophically talking about it or reading about it so you can talk about it. You are experiencing it, you know, which is, um, you know, another way to say that, you know, it's, it's kind of like a spiritual and religious kind of a thing. You know, the religious kind of is a participation in something. Um, yeah. So I found that that changed my life quite a bit. It actually improved um, I, I've, I've reaped a lot of, uh, positivity from that. Um, because now it's like, okay, I'll settle in here. And then I start to go in deep and deeper and deeper. And, um, by living in this space, um, it, it feels like, uh, there's some progress occurring. That's it. And, you know, to, to, to be frank about it, I'm, I'm way less impressed by someone who can quote me chapter and verse of the gospels than I am by someone who I see as trying to live them. Mm. And unfortunately, what what passed, <laughs> there's kind of a puritan, the Puritans I think have a little bit to do with this as well, go back to history. Mm -hmm. What passed for being, you know, someone being very religious was that they knew their Bible and could quote your chapter and verse and they knew their catechism and all these important things you need to do. We absolutely do need to engage with those of, if, if we have faith, we need to engage with the texts of our faith, mm -hmm. regardless of which faith we're talking about. But boy, do we need to act. Mm -hmm. You know, and like you say, it's in that practice, it's in doing it, you will find the true understanding and the true message and the true meaning and the lessons that need to be learned because we're, we're, all, kind of, we're all kind of students. And when Benedict was writing his rule, his idea was to create monasteries in his mind were schools. You know, mm -hmm. and it's only in that we can learn all the theory in in uh, through reading and philosophizing and gazing at our navels and coming up with clever things to say to each other to show that we really understand mm -hmm. what, what, for example, the gospel say. But then I need to see people get out and do it. I need to mm -hmm. see people live it and put it into practice. And you, you know, I come from a background where I had a trade as a welder. You you've mm -hmm. worked extensively with people in engineering and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to learn it on the classroom, yeah, uh, board. It's another thing to go out into the world and do it. Yeah. And the true measure of a welder or a plumber or an electrician or an engineer is how well they perform in real world circumstances. Sure. And that's where yeah. you learn. You learn all those you learn all those things that make you really good at what you do and appreciate what you do and make you valuable as a member of that wider group. Mm. And for me as a Catholic, going out and trying to trying to live the gospel at home with my with 
my family and trying to live within the community and give them what I can be that time or experience or expertise to, to help other people along, money, mm-hmm. whatever, whatever it is. I find that the, those practices are where I really understand what it means to be a Catholic yeah. or a Christian, right. if you like. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I, I love the books, as you know, Scott, and I love mm. the reading, and I love the Lexio Divina, <laughs> which is sacred reading that leads me into contemplation, something we can talk about another time, mm-hmm. contemplative prayer and life. But but really, with something like the Rule of Benedict, that's saying, that's great, Jason. It's great you're doing all those things. Mm-hmm. Now, now live it. Yeah. That's the challenge that's laid down. In the, you know, it's kind of taken that these guys are monks, they're going to know their Bible, they're going, they're going to know their church fathers, they're going to know right from wrong. Mm-hmm. The challenge that Benedict is given the monks and given us, and it's not a great challenge, as he says. Mm-hmm. He says, the strong will find something to yearn for, and the weak will find nothing to turn away from. Mm-hmm. And it's to, it's, it's to live it, to experience it. Yeah. And any faith or religion that isn't experienced or lived is a dying faith. Hmm. If it's purely in the realm of textual analysis and rote learning, mm-hmm. it loses it loses a huge amount of its significance. And really, the rule is is a school for life. Mm-hmm. Saying, get out, get out there and practice it. And uh, you're absolutely right. It's in that practice. Mm-hmm. You, a lot of people who suspect or think they have no faith, I think if they actually practiced a little bit real world situations would 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 absolutely find that there's plenty there to hold on to yeah yeah that's what i found you know and i think that's what you found too (laughs) absolutely yeah yeah Yeah. you know i i don't know um i don't know if you know the answer to this one but the uh you know pope benedict the 16th um has he ever said why he took that name he he did rice he did if i'm not mistaken he did write a little bit about Benedict, mm-hmm. and uh, he certainly mentioned the rule. I think it's I think it's pretty obvious that he took he took the name from the kind of the, so Saint Benedict's sister, Sister Scholastica, again. And I think um, Pope Benedict, being that type of scholastic type person as well in his background and his training and his theology, yep. I think it appealed to him. Mm-hmm. Where where the Benedictine tradition, for example, does value education. It does value, despite what I just said about <clears throat> it absolutely does value biblical study, exegist, mm-hmm. uh, and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So I, I, I on the hop, I can't say for exactly I read definitively that he mm-hmm. that A leads to B, but I suspect mm-hmm. like all these things, they're fairly carefully yeah. chosen. I think I think the name is more a signifier for intent for the broader global church. Right. And I think, he yeah. was, I think he was signaling that bringing about something again where, where family, where community mm-hmm. become important, where we should look maybe that bit closer to ourselves in that Benedictine tradition, where we should, we should, look, we should look at a more localized level. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very easy to sling muds at big targets, you know. <laughs> it's very easy to cast dispersions on large walls, and you know. And some of it will stick because there's a lot of surface area. Right. I right. think what Benedictine spirituality and maybe what Pope Benedict was signaling was: we know that's going on and that needs to be dealt with, but we also need to start looking at the family again mm-hmm. as you know. Yeah. Uh, following on from Pope John Paul II, you know. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Primacy of the family is a unit that you know, despite despite everything going on, it's still a pretty good way to function mm-hmm. in a in a society and to hold people together. You know, sure, as best yeah. you can in changing circumstances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But yeah, I, I think that, I think it was the intent was to. Okay, yeah, I was, just, I was just curious. You know, mm-hmm. as we were talking about that, that question kind of leapt into my head there because <clears throat> you know he is somebody I admire. He's He's like a, a university professor almost, you know. That was uh, he was he was like the professor pope. That, that's why I went to the the Benedict sister being scholastic, uh, yeah, yeah. Scholastic because it, she's associated now with that kind of 
scholastic approach, not so much scholastic theology, but just that scholarism that comes to uh, approaching religion. And it, it is really under, it is really important, like like the rule says as well. It's it's it is really important to focus in on religion for a second. I know our mm-hmm. talk is broader, but it is really important for people to 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 read their gospels and read the Psalms mm-hmm. and know their prayers and understand the words they're saying if they're saying a prayer and to understand what's meant by parts of the catechism and stuff like that, you know, because some of it is fairly self-evident, but other bits need, they need investigation and they need explaining and exemplifying, for example, yeah, for people. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of really important that people need to to do that. Mm-hmm. You know, that aura et labora, that balance between a prayer for life and a working life, mm-hmm. and making each makes time for the other. Yeah, you know, right. And, and finding a balance in life for a lot of people, work life balance has been the mantra for the last two decades. Yeah, it, it's it's I fascinating mean, that that was you know, <laughs> in you know, again, fourteen hundred years ago. He's talking he gave, about work-life balance, right? It, it's yeah, just amazing, he, yeah. He, he gave it down to the hour of the day and changed the yeah. seasons and everything. He laid out a work-life balance because, you know, I mean, this is the discretion of the guy. He could foresee that people living together, that some people would take on all the work and other people would cause <laughs> And You think of any job you've ever oh, worked in. No Scott, question, yep, yep. This is what happened. And in families too, you know, in families too, you know, uh, you, you mentioned families, you know, but in families as well, it doesn't mean, you know, uh, the work specifically, but, but just, uh, you know, at work, at home, uh, each one of these has aspects of that exact balance thing. You need balance at home, you need balance at work, and you need balance between them, you know, and, and that's all very hard, you know, to, to keep on top of, but you can tell when you're unbalanced. You, you, Things start you, you not can, going well, right? Yep. Yeah, and you, 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 you can sense it almost as it's happening. Yep. You, know, you yep. can say, yeah. if you can't nail it down, you can sense it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's work-life balance, prayer for life balance, balancing anything you believe in fundamentally that's important to your life, like, like your religion, it might be your job, it might be your family, your spouse, or, or all of the above. And it's very unfair in one way to allocate just a kind of a simple blunt instrument like time, mm. like to say, well, I'm only going to do like eight hours in work and then mm-hmm. I'm going to have six hours at home with my evening, even with my family on weekends off. Because yep. that's a very blunt measure. We have to be careful that we also look at things like the quality of what we're doing, the activities we're doing. Yeah, agreed. When the meaningful engagement is going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can be at work for eight hours a day, sitting beside you for work at eight hours a day, mm-hmm. but you get four times more work done. Hmm. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. these are just blunt, they're blunt measurements. And, right. Uh, <clears throat> the danger is people fall into the trap of saying, well, if I only have to work 40 hours a week and then I get, you know, a month's mm-hmm. vacation every year and I get all my weekends off, well, then my life will be in balance. It won't. Your time is bit more balanced it's what you do that's that's almost returning to the idea of practice right because you've got you can uh give yourself a chart and with percentages and and time blocks and things but what are you practicing right what is what is happening in that time you know Mm -hmm. um it's it's that depth of practice that that you're missing with with the chart you know so i mean the chart can be part of it i guess is what i'm saying but it's like it's the practice that's the thing. And that's what the rule is all about, right? It's like this framework in which you can be and help you achieve these things. Absolutely. Look mm-hmm. look at the explosion in recent years of like, uh, you know, uh, apps and things designed to help you calendar your day. I use them. I'm yeah, sure you Yeah, I do. Them. Yeah, of course. I, I got mm-hmm. a reminder like a half an hour before this that I could come in and make sure yeah. everything was set up and all that kind of stuff. And they're incredibly useful. But like you say, they're only allocating time. They're not really telling you how <laughs> useful that time that time right. is. And yeah. I can feel better sometimes by listing out everything I'm going to do. As we've spoken before, I'm a mm-hmm. big fan of strategic planning. Yes, yes. I do the um, same, yeah. Well, I got an action on it. Mm-hmm. And I think the yeah. rule of when, 
or anybody, whether they're Catholic, Christian, non-Christian, and it has a broader appeal. It, it, it gets referenced a lot more than, you know, within a very narrow confines of, say, you know, the Benedictine order or something like that. It mm-hmm. has a broader appeal. And there's lots of great books, if anyone is interested. There's, you'll find loads of great books of commentaries of people who aren't religious at all talking about it and how they apply it. So yeah. Or, yeah. How it impacts them, for example. But really, it's it's just like a great like that guidebook and a framework. And I find it personally very useful. And I continue to explore its true meaning. I continue to explore how I can best implement it in my own life. And I continue to be inspired by something written by a monk. 1400 years ago in you know rural Italy mm-hmm. and to me that's kind of amazing it's <laughs> actually kind of amazing and I it's still it. so uh, and a lot of what I read and have read over the years as kind of how to live guides how to live better guides are really drawn heavily from uh, from the rule of St. Benedict but are nowhere near as concise and as clear and as forgiving as he is in saying, hey, you can do this. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, you know, very reassuring to read a guide by, by someone saying, yeah, this might seem difficult, but trust me, it's not. <laughs> It'll be fine. You just gotta practice. And like that, monks are allowed to fail. You know, he's like, if, if a monk does something wrong, don't don't come down on him like it's on bricks. <laughs> Give him a chance to improve and do better. And if he fails again, you know what? Give him another chance to improve and do better. Yeah. yeah. From a point where he'll say, okay, enough's enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a very forgiving text. And that's why I say a rule is a little bit misleading. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a guide and a framework. Right. Wonderful. And I, I absolutely love it, Scott. So yeah. There As do I. I'm, I'm learning, you know, but uh, I, I sure can see this, this benefit. Um, and thank you so very much. I appreciate you so much. Um, yeah, I've learned yeah. so much from you. And uh, well, continue I learned to. a lot just talking to you. Yeah, it's great. I'm glad. Yeah. 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 So. And uh, hopefully some people will listen to this. Ah, sure. You bet. Whether you're Catholic or not, uh, I, there's so much here, you know. And, and like I said, I've found uh, in talking to, to non-Catholics, there's a lot of uh, ideas that people uh, take and run with and... Uh, yeah. I think it's beneficial. I think it's great. So that, that's it. And th- there's no exclusivity here. Not at all. You know, mm-hmm. it isn't exclusively for the use of any one group of people. This is yeah. this is a text that I'm pretty sure anyone could could if they approach this text in an open manner mm-hmm. could find something in it right. uh, that they'll go, "Wow, yeah." At least at least find that it makes sense. Mm. You know. Yep. Uh, and more importantly, maybe find something that explains something a bit better for them. Agreed. Uh, Agreed. No, no exclusivity here. All <laughs> in something. Welcome to the rule of Saint Ben. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks again. And take. Okay. Yep. Take care, everybody. Bye.